Tonight, Jeremy Hunt announces a big national insurance tax cut, but the tax burden is on course to be the highest it's been since the Second World War. What's going on? The Chancellor claims the UK economy is back on track, but the UK's growth forecast is slashed. Tonight, Jeremy Hunt admits to Sky News it will take time to bring taxes down. As the electoral battle lines are drawn, I'll be speaking live in a moment to the Chief Secretary to the Treasury, Laura Trott, and later the Shadow Business Secretary, Jonathan Reynolds. And Jeremy Hunt revives the spirit of a 43-year-old TV ad campaign. We'll tell you which one. All that and more with John McDonnell and Tim Montgomery, who will be with us for the next hour. It's Wednesday, I'm Sadie Ridge, live from Westminster, and this is The Politics Hub. Hello, good evening. Well, just before we start tonight, I wanted to warn you, we are expecting to hear from the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu this hour. He's due to give a press conference where he's expected to give us a lot more detail on that potential deal reached with Hamas over hostages and a pause in fighting. So when that happens, we'll bring that to you live. But on today's autumn statement, now Jeremy Hunt stood up in the House of Commons today and announced what he described as the biggest tax cut in British history. But what if I told you that actually you'll be paying more tax next year and the year after that and the year after that? And it's because of a sleight of hand that we'll end up raising enough cash to fund the entire police service and then some. Now, when I told my team that I was thinking about speaking to you this evening about the fiscal drag, I'll be honest, there was a bit of concern about the viewing figures. But this is actually really important. The fiscal drag basically means the number of people who are dragged into paying a high rate of tax without the government actually increasing the nominal tax rate. So in other words, it's a stealth tax. By freezing the tax thresholds that the government's done every year, um, every year more people will end up paying more tax. So the fiscal drag will raise, get this, £12.4 billion next year, and then it goes up fast, really fast, rising to £44.6 billion in five years' time. £44 billion. You know, we really are through the looking glass now. To put it in context, right now, the entire budget for the Department for Transport is £28 billion. So by 2028 to 29, the fiscal drag will be funding multiple government departments. I mean, they're not going to put that on the side of a bus. And, you know, I'm, I'm not sure if it's just me, but are we really OK with this much of our public spending being funded by a tax rise that no one's really talking about? Well, let's get a bit more, shall we, on the autumn statement. This is our political editor, Beth Rigby, on the day the Chancellor appeared to take a pre-election gamble. An autumn statement for growth from a government and a party in decline and trying to turn its fortunes around before a general election. Is this the last chance to win an election, Chancellor? Is this the last roll of the dice? Is this enough, Chancellor? He certainly hopes so, clutching his autumn statement and hoping its contents can convince voters. Jermel. Our choice is not big government, high spending and high tax, because we know that leads to less growth, not more. Instead, we reduce debt cut taxes and reward work. The headline offer a two percentage point cut to national insurance for January. That change will help 27 million people. I'm introducing urgent legislation to bring it in from January the 6th. So people can see, so people can see the benefit in their payslips at the start of the new year. And for businesses, an 11 billion tax break for those investing in machinery and equipment. I will today make full expensing permanent. That is the largest business tax cut in modern British history. The message crystal clear. We cut taxes to help bigger businesses invest. We cut taxes to help smaller businesses grow. We cut taxes for the self-employed who keep our country running. But reality somewhat different to rhetoric. Whatever he said at the dispatch box, independent forecasts show the overall tax burden will still be growing and we're all still being taxed more. But this Chancellor wanting to give voters an immediate hit. We will increase the full new state pension, increase universal credit, increase the national living wage. Rachel Reeves! Yeah! 
Labour arguing small giveaways now is all too little, too late. The questions that people will be asking at the next election and after today's autumn statements are simple. Do me and my family feel better off after 13 years of Conservative government? In fact, does anything in Britain work better today than when the Conservatives came into office 13 years ago? The Chancellor wants you, the voter, to give him credit for cutting taxes. But is it all smoke and mirrors? It sounds like a tax giveaway, but you know and I know the NI cut is worth £9 billion. Pounds. It's dwarfed by the £45 billion pounds you are taking as people get pulled into higher tax bans because you have frozen thresholds and by wage rises as well. Overall, have you taxed more or cut taxes more? Uh, we have put taxes up because it was the right thing to do so to support families. Hang on, will you let me answer the question, Beth? Because it was the right thing to do to support families and businesses through the pandemic and energy shock. We said that when we could afford to do so, mm. providing it didn't hurt uh, the battle against inflation, which is also eroding mm. people's incomes, we would start to bring them down. Are taxes going up or down under this government? Taxes have gone up and They're we are starting up. to bring them down. Just so voters are clear about when you say you're a low tax party, that's the reality. Taxes will have gone up. What I can say is my commitment to voters is that when I had a chance to lighten the tax burden, I'm a Conservative. I believe in doing so. What this statement does do is calm a restive Tory backbench, at least for now. What he has managed to do is um, satisfy colleagues who do not are not prepared to vote for any new taxes that increase the overall tax burden. We've broken away from that, I think, what the uh, Chancellor described as a death spiral of ever-increasing taxes. Would I have loved him to go further? Yes, but I'll take the win today. This was an autumn statement from a government firmly in election mode. 20 billion of personal and business tax cuts announced. It was, if you like, another reset moment from a stuttering government. But the Chancellor has a problem. Taxes in Britain are still on course to hit a post-war high and all of our taxes are still going up. And that makes the pitch of being the party of low taxes a very hard sell to voters indeed. The government is hoping voters will notice a bit of extra cash in their pockets, at least in the short term. If there was ever a sign an election is coming soon, that could be it. Beth Rigby, Sky News, Westminster. Well, Beth joins us live uh, now from Downing Street. Beth, you obviously interviewed the Chancellor today. What, what was he seeming like? Well, to be honest, he got a bit tetchy when I pressed him on what you were talking about earlier, Sophie, which is the fiscal drag. Now, that is basically a technical term for people being pulled into higher tax brackets because the government has frozen tax thresholds. So as your wages go up, you get pulled into higher tax bans. Put it into context, looking at the OBR, the independent forecaster, they're saying by 2028, 4 million more people will be paying the 20% income tax rate. Three million of us will be paying uh, the 40%, the higher tax rate. That's seven million people being pulled uh, into higher tax bans or indeed having to start paying income tax. And I think this is the rub, really, that, yes, there have been some sort of immediate hits in terms of that national insurance cut or the pensioners' 8.5% uh, lift uh, in the state pension, but the headlines tomorrow will be the highest ever tax burden for this country. And that makes it really difficult for a Chancellor to say that the Conservatives are a party of low tax. You saw in that interview, he couldn't tell me that taxes would be going down in this Parliament because they won't. That's not what the forecasts have. And it's literally they don't have uh, the manoeuvrability to do that. So when it comes to a reset moment, this was another one. We've talked a lot, haven't we, about uh, the... Um, speech in Parliament at the comp sorry the conference speech the King's uh, speech uh, in which he sets out his legislative agenda the reshuffle the autumn statement a big reset moment and I'm afraid to say that 
whilst the tax cuts do signal an intent, voters might be scratching their heads saying, well, I don't feel better off. And I'm reading today that actually uh, all of our taxes are still going up. That's a good point. Uh, Beth Rigby, thank you very much indeed. Beth, uh, speaking to us from Downing Street, where a little earlier she interviewed the Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt. Well, as ever, the devil is in the detail when it comes to these so-called fiscal events. Well, here's the master of detail, our economics editor, Ed Conway, to talk us through what felt what it felt like today was going to be a bit of a pre-election paradox. Well, the autumn statement really begins with the story of the economy, the story of growth, economic growth, how much things are improving or indeed getting worse. Last time around, this is showing you GDP, economic growth, uh, in the coming years. And the forecast that we got from the Office of Budget Responsibility back in March, OK? And it was going to be a recession in this year and then much stronger growth going out into the future. This time around, let's bring on those latest figures. Better in 2023, so no recession, 0.6% growth. But look at the following years, weaker in 2024, much weaker in 2025, and then getting back to more or less trend. That's disappointing because less growth means less in the way of tax revenue. It means that basically you're not having that feel-good factor. We'll come back to that in just a second. However, the cost of living crisis, of course, this has been the big story for us uh, over the last few years. And here again, the forecast from the OBR, this was last time back in March, it's subtly changed, but subtly uh, and really importantly in this case, because while they think inflation is coming down, it's not getting down quite as fast as it was previously. So down to around 2% rather than 0%. And higher inflation means more people being drawn into those higher tax brackets, which is really significant. And when you look at tax, obviously we did have those tax changes uh, from the Chancellor. But have a look at this. This is the tax burden. It's showing you just how much tax we're paying across the economy, all taxes, so personal taxes, but also business taxes. And have a look. Last time around, it was expected to get up really quite high. This time, before all of those tax cuts, particularly the national insurance cuts, were integrated uh, by the government, it looked like it was heading up here, pretty much into the stratosphere. After those tax cuts are incorporated, that line is a bit lower. However, if we kind of draw a line, taking it all the way back to the 1940s, it is still, the tax burden is still going to be at the highest level since at least 1948. So while Jeremy Hunt wants to call this a tax-cutting autumn statement, in practice, this government is raising taxes, raising the incidence of taxes. But in a way, perhaps the most important of all the charts is this one, because it's showing you whether you're getting better off each year or worse off. It's household disposable income, pound in your pocket. And for most of history, again, we're looking back to the 1950s in this case, for most of history, it was going up, up, up each year. This is a growth rate. But now look, this is what was forecast last time around by the Office of Budget Responsibility. A grim two years, the worst squeeze that we'd ever had before. Now, the latest figures, they're a little bit better in this year but the squeeze goes on for one extra year, into that election year and potentially beyond. And still, it is the biggest fall in our standard of living since the 1950s. That is the backdrop, really, to this autumn statement. That's the big economic story. And when the Chancellor talks about trying to get the feel-good factor back, it's very hard to do it against a backdrop of such severe strain in the economy. Well, let's pick up on some of those points, shall we? The Chief Secretary to the Treasury, Laura Trott, joins us now. Good to have you Hello, here. Hello, thank you. Lovely to be here. What's your sort of main reaction to the autumn statement today, then? Well, obviously, this was an autumn statement for growth. It was about backing business and supporting people. We know we've had a really difficult year, um, but because of the difficult decisions that the Chancellor has taken, that the Prime Minister has taken, we've managed to halve inflation, which means that we've been able to take the measures we have today, like giving a tax cut to 27 million employed people. Obviously, the cut to national insurance, two percentage points off national insurance, is going to make a difference to people. It really will. £450 a year, but on the, average. But the overall tax burden is still going up next year, right? So the, the steps that we've taken today will bring it down by 0.7%. That is significant. Obviously, we've had a couple of years where we've had to spend a lot of money, or £400 billion pounds on COVID, £100 billion pounds on supporting people's energy, those were the right things to do. I think people at home would recognise that. And we've got to pay for them. But this was still the biggest tax-cutting uh, event since the 1980s, and that is significant. But the tax burden is still going up next year. So if you look at what we've done overall, so for the average worker, uh, taxes will be going up on average due to today and everything we've done since 2010 by £1,000 a year. But it is true that some of the highest paid 
will see their taxes going up still, but that is a decision that we've made. We are really supporting those uh, who are working, who are the lowest paid, and you've seen that through everything we've done today, and additionally, what we've done with benefits. it's not just... Look, I, I don't want to sort of... You know, the national insurance car... That's a car, like you say, yep. it's significant. But the freeze in income tax thresholds is a big deal, the tax drag, right? It means four million of the lowest paid people are also going to be pulled into paying tax. I mean, under the, I remember David Cameron in the coalition, he took 3.2 million people out of paying income tax and now Rishi Sunak's put 4 million back in. What does well, David Cameron say about this? We do not shy away from the fact we had to take difficult decisions a year ago, right? And that is why we've seen inflation come down. But that is it's also why... Rich, though, isn't it, no, but that is also why we've done things today. You know, no, no, but that's also history, why we've done things to today. Actually, more people pay, pay more tax. Uh, you know, real incomes, for example, for those on the national living wage have gone up by 30%, right? You know, we've increased the national living wage today um, by a huge amount, by 9.8%, which means it'll go to £11.44 pence for um, someone on that. And this is all because of the things that we've done. And if you contrast that to the Labour Party, the Labour Party who still want to borrow £28 billion extra a year, that will push up mortgages, that will push up people's taxes. There's a real difference between us and them. And even today, Rachel Reeves was saying that she would unfreeze thresholds. She was implying that we'd un she would un difficult to say, mm -hmm. unfreeze thresholds today in, um, in the Commons. And that will cost £45 billion a year. You know, where are they proposing to get this money? There is a real difference between us and the Labour Party. And um, we've spoken a lot about tax. I just want to talk to you about public services. Of course. Uh, because it feels like you've pencilled in a massive squeeze in public services once inflation's taken into account. And I just want to show you this uh, graph just to try and illustrate uh, what I'm trying to say. So this is the projected spending uh, in government departments. The yellow line there at the top uh, is a projected line from March and the blue line is today. So you've effectively taken out Nineteen billion pounds uh, in what does public Escape services. Escape mean? So I, I will, so this is my area. So what in terms of the amount that we're spending on public services, it has gone up um, by two point six percent since the spending review in real terms. Uh, that's the whole amount of public spending. And by the end of what we call the forecast period, so that's twenty eight twenty nine, it would have gone up by eighty five billion pounds in real terms. Now, of course, within that, we've made some choices. We have prioritised the NHS. NHS spending is up by a third since 2019, and that's excluding COVID spend. We all so, know, you know and I know, yeah. that what you're projecting post the election really means a huge squeeze in non-protected departments. And that's things like the courts, that's things like capital budgets, that's things like transport. You so, know that. So that's we're increasing... So, so, yes, you're right in terms of choices, we're increasing spending by 1% in real terms overall. So that's really important for people at home to understand. Now, within that, there will be decisions. We will prioritise certain areas. We will prioritise the NHS. We will prioritise schools. That is really important. But spending is going up in real terms, and it's very important it to remember that. It feels a little bit like it's a kind of scorched-earth policy for an incoming Labour no. government. I mean, 85... No one expects you to stick to these spending plans. 1% real, real is an expansion in spending. You know, that is a big expansion in spending, 1% real. £85 billion pounds more in real terms by 2028-29. You know, there is questions as to the growth of public spending versus the growth of GDP overall. But we can be absolutely clear that public spending is going up in real terms. OK. Now, you've been brought into the um, Treasury in a sanctum, shall we say. You've kind of been made Chief Secretary to the Treasury. So I just wonder if you could kind of take me behind the scenes a bit. How much of a backseat driver is Rishi Sunak? Look, there's, I have worked in government for a long period of time, so I used to be a special advisor in Number 10 under David Cameron. Um, delighted to see him back. Um, uh, and there is always very close working, and it's really important there is close working between Number 10 and the Treasury, because, and that will always be the case, where you have a united team, and that is what we do have now, a united team. We've got so is Rishi Sunak together. kind of in and out, looking over Jeremy Hunt's shoulder, saying, oh, I'd do this a bit differently when I was in the job? <laughs> Uh, no, um, but they are working together, as you would expect, and people at home would expect the Prime Minister and Chancellor to be working very closely together on a fiscal event. And then my other question, right, on, so on last night's show, we spoke to Harriet Baldwin, who yes. used to be a minister in the Treasury, and she said that even when she was a Treasury minister, she didn't actually know what was going to be in the autumn statement, the entire autumn statement, before it happened. Is that still the case now? Some bits are kept 
away and obviously each of the individual ministers have individual bits which mm -hmm. they are working on um, but obviously it's the Chancellor and Prime Minister who see the whole the whole view of did, the whole Did thing. you see the whole thing before? Uh, I don't want to go into what well, I did some and of it didn't a bit, see. Was it a surprise? Uh, uh, well, I don't want to go into what I did and didn't see but yes it's true that some bits are seen by certain ministers not by others. Uh, fascinating stuff. Uh, Laura Trott thank you very much. Thank indeed. you so much. Thank you for being on the programme uh, there. OK, we've got a little bit of uh, breaking news to bring you now, an update uh, on some news coming out to us through the United States, Canada, the US-Canada border, I should say, in Niagara Falls. Now, we're hearing that there has been a vehicle explosion. The White House says it's closely monitoring the situation. You can see the uh, pictures there, the latest pictures. Law enforcement is on scene and investigating. That picture is there from uh, New York. We'll bring you the latest uh, on that, of course, uh, as we get it. Coming up to the break as well, after the break as well, we'll get reaction to the autumn statement from our panel, John McDonnell and Tim Montgomery. Stay with us. Welcome back. We've got a little bit of breaking news to bring you now from our city editor, Mark Kleinman. It's about a significant announcement later this week from the Prime Minister and the Chancellor. Mark, what can you tell us? Yeah, that's right, Sophie. My understanding is that there will be a significant boost for Britain's automotive sector uh, later this week. Um, my understanding tonight is that Nissan, the giant Japanese car maker, will announce on Friday that it is committing to manufacturing the electric versions of its Qashqai and Duke models at its plant in Sunderland. Now, Nissan Sunderland plant is already Britain's biggest uh, car uh, manufacturing site, and this will be a significant long-term boost uh, to Nissan's uh, plant in Sunderland. Uh, both the Prime Minister and the Chancellor, I understand, have been in talks for some time with the company about securing uh, the investment that will be announced on Friday. My understanding is that um, over a billion pounds or thereabouts will be committed by Nissan as part of this project. And I also understand that some taxpayer 
money will potentially be involved as well. I'm told that there won't be uh, cash going in from the government up front, but that there will be government guarantees provided to Nissan, uh, which have helped secure this uh, investment. Uh, as I say, Nissan's Sunderland plant employs 6,000 people. There have been a number of key announcements from car makers about their British uh, production uh, facilities uh, this year. This will be the latest of them on Friday. And as I understand it, uh, both the Prime Minister and the Chancellor will be in Sunderland uh, to announce this news uh, in a couple of days' time. OK, Mark, thank you very much indeed. Right, we're talking an awful lot about the autumn statement tonight. Let's bring in uh, our duo for the evening, uh, <laughs> shall we, and get a bit of reaction. Uh, that is Tim Montgomery, uh, the Conservative commentator and also the former Shadow Chancellor, John McDonnell. Good to have you both with us. Um, what did you make of the autumn statement today, then? I have a golden rule about budgets and autumn statements. Mm -hmm. The louder the cheering on the day, the greater the disappointment by the weekend. Mm -hmm. This hasn't lasted till the weekend. To actually then announce this is a tax-cutting budget, in effect, and then within hours to be confronted with the reality that actually taxes are going up. I think it was a real mistake to try and disguise the threshold issue, the fiscal drag issue, with the cut in national insurance, because one out so greatly out outweighs the other. It's exposed immediately, really. So I think it was a bit of a disaster, to be honest, in political terms. I also think it was in economic terms. And also, I have to say, my personal dislike of the proposals today were the, the cuts to benefits to disabled people, 1.2 billion taken off disabled people and sick people. And I think that was a sort of a, an echo of what we might see in the run-up to a general election. And I don't want the Tory party returning to the nasty party. We want to... We want a decent politics in this country, and that wasn't decent, I'm afraid. What do you make of it? Well, look, I'm, I want taxes cut, um, but I'm afraid you educated the, your viewers very well, I think, earlier, so the fact that taxes are, are rising. What I'd like to see, and John and I might even be able to agree on this, is some sort of big structural reforms that would actually allow the tax burden to come down in future. So one thing I would do, which could have a cross-party consensus, <clears throat> build a lot more council houses to begin to reduce the, the housing benefit, the, the, the general housing... That's the sort of structural change. It would need some investment up front, but you could say this is a down payment for the future. You know, and make allocation of those um, council houses dependent upon something like proximity for the extended family, because then you start reducing childcare costs. Exactly. And that sort of imaginative, yeah. bold measure is the only way, long term, we're going to keep our tax burden competitive. But this had to feel, and I heard Ken Clark earlier say, the tax pressure is going to be very big after the next election. And so voters aren't stupid. And I think they can, although they want a tax cut, I think they know it's probably not going to last very long. I, I can't understand either. They're trailing out the usual stories to petrify people about the... £28 billion pounds worth of investment in greening the economy. £28 billion, pounds, uh, if you're going at current interest rates, will cost about a billion pounds. But they know as well as I do that investment will pay for itself through the multiplier as well as tax coming in. So there are even their criticisms of Labour didn't stack up very well. I thought it was all very poorly handled politically. I'm a little bit different with John on the benefits thing. I take what he says about benefits for disability people, but I welcome the fact actually the general up rating was more oh, generous yeah. than some feared. And I supported yes, the cut. They trail the pos possible cut, I mean, and it, then we just get back to normal. And even that sort of it tawdry, be, well, doesn't That's really. a bit politics. We, yeah. we, 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 you, even you might have done that occasionally, John. But <laughs> I think the fact is that when the Tories sort of cut benefits, trim benefits at the start of the time they were in office. Benefits probably were beginning to impinge upon the work incentives. But I think most people realise we all are struggling to pay some of our bills these days. And, and I think the up rating generally today was the right thing to do. Can I, can I ask you mm. what it's like to respond to a statement like that? Because I actually think it must oh. be really hard. You know, we saw the Shadow Chancellor and Richard Rees having to get to their feet straight yeah. after. You, what, what's it like? You've been you, in that. you get this speech about 45 minutes before, mm. and the tradition is then you can go through it and you've got your team going through it. What George Osborne used to do, and then Rishi Sunak did, and I, I went through, I think, four different ch uh, chancellors. Mm. They increasingly redacted the speech. Did they? The yes, they gave yes. And, and there'll be what, lots the of... Yes, the main announcements? Yes, 
Some, some understand because they mm. affect the market. Mm -hmm. But you get it 45 minutes before and you prepare and you know roughly what's coming. And most of this was trailed, wasn't it? Mm. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it because mm. you could get up and really have a go. In addition to that, it is a challenge and you feel actually that gives you the opportunity of presenting your alternative. Mm. So I quite... My team were fantastic and I really in enjoyed participating in that. And I miss it a bit now, obviously. But I was getting a bit angrier and angry each year, the more reductions <laughs> going on. I trust you, they thought we were going to leak it out. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> Maybe you were too good at responding, that was the problem. <laughs> um, how do you think this will go down with Conservative uh, MPs? Well, I think what Conservative MPs, and certainly I think, is... You're completely right. The overall setting is we've still got taxes rising. But I think the view on the Tory backbenchers is... They've given the tax cut because they know things have gone too far with tax. This is a sign that the front bench, who probably are more sort of fiscally conservative than the back bench, are under pressure from the overall party. And so I think this is the beginning of the Tory tax cutters taking control of the party again. It's not enough, and it's a bit of a false dawn, if you like, today. But I don't think any longer Rishi Sunak, Jeremy Hunt will be able to resist what is a very clear consensus amongst the party as a whole, that the tax burden is too high. Uh, really interesting to talk to both of you. Thank you very much indeed. Coming up next on The Politics Hub, we've heard the view from Westminster, but what do voters make of today's announcements? Hello and welcome back to The Politics Hub. Now, it's been a whirlwind of facts, figures, claims and counterclaims about the state of the economy. And I was sat here witnessing all of it. So I just wanted to bring you a snapshot of the day. 
Well, there's not long to go now until the Chancellor makes his autumn statement, setting out the government's plans for the economy. Is now the right time for tax cuts, Chancellor? strategist said to me uh, yesterday when I asked them about these dividing lines they said their bigger problem isn't what to put in the autumn statement it's having a leader who keeps changing strategy it's a bit like watching a drunk driver moving down the road I mean, you're the government let's remind no, no, you I am in opposition where's, where's your policy um, your policy is 28 billion pounds a year of more spending are you borrowing that irresponsible so, borrowing which is exactly so you are what you borrow did that. when you, you crashed the economy, economy. Okay, you made your point. Point. Our plan for the British economy is working, but the work is not done. Both he and I wanted to make a Jeremy Prime Minister. <laughs> In fairness, his party and mine are probably equally relieved we failed. <laughs> We are delivering the biggest business tax cut in modern British history. The largest ever cut to employee and self-employed national insurance. And the biggest package of tax cuts to be implemented since the 1980s. The Chancellor claims that the economy has turned a corner. Yet the truth is that under the Conservatives, growth has hit a dead end. Yes. It really felt like a pre-election autumn statement. It, it really did, and actually, we were just saying it did what it said on the tin. A lot of these numbers, uh, I don't want to be too real, they're sort of made up. I mean, in terms of the, um, <laughs> the, the spending numbers. <laughs> this is a reality. <laughs> Fabulous little sequence from Ed Conway earlier where he was doing his Bruce Forsyth essay. Will it be higher? Will it be lower? And now it is heading there to the highest level since at least 1948. It's very hard for this Chancellor uh, and this Prime Minister to say they're presiding over a low-tax economy. It is not a low-tax economy. It is the highest-tax economy that we've had in a lifetime. Well, the Chancellor, as we just saw, announced a package of measures on pay and tax that he hopes will boost the Conservative chances at the next election. So how's it been going down in a key swing constituency? Here's our political correspondent, Tamara Cohen, now. She's got... This time of year with Christmas hey. kind of making me feel like a bit of a failed mother. Look! Hey. <laughs> Carla and her baby son, Remy, have been living on her parents' sofa for a year. She can't afford to rent privately, even though she works, and will make a saving on national insurance. We was looking at private renting as it was one of our options, and it was still a thousand pound a month just for the rent. Just for rent. Yeah. And before we even think about energy bills and yeah, and is that just completely out of reach? Yeah, definitely, especially being a part-time single mom. <laughs> The Chancellor is hoping areas like this hear loud and clear that tax cuts are coming. The measures announced today will put money in some people's pockets. But here in Dudley South, a target seat for Labour, whether it's families or those who run a business, people are telling us the struggle with the cost of living has never been harder. Self-employed traders will also get a national insurance cut, but say footfall is down and overhead soaring. When we started this company about 10 years ago, our energy costs were about 15% of our rent costs. But now we're approaching the 70% mark. Now, if that's not an elephant in the garden, I don't know what is. Everything. Everything's gone up. The big stores can manage, but people like us, you know, we struggle. So I'm glad I'm at the age I am and where well, I am because I would never start out in butchery again, never, ever. Um, it's just too, too tough to run your own business now. If you were just starting out now, you wouldn't survive. Better news for the elderly. The state pension will get a £17 a week increase next year. Will it help you a bit? Well, it'll help, but virtually, against the price of the bills, it's going to be nothing, is it, to drop in the ocean? <laughs> It's a government trying to signal there are better times ahead, but hard-pressed families wondering if it all adds up. Tamara Cohen, Sky News, Dudley. Tamara there. But whatever the challenges <clears throat> facing the economy, well, they could soon be Labour's responsibility. So let's speak to the Shadow Business Secretary, Jonathan Reynolds, shall we? Who would want to win the next election? 
Well, we would. I've been on the other side of these uh, autumn statements and budgets, and I'd like the chance to do one. And look, yes, I mean, we knew already going into this, working people aren't better off after 13 years of Conservative government. Now we know that's not going to change. There's nothing, no, no big story in the government's plans. I mean, an autumn statement for growth, growth down next year, year after that, year after that. Headlines on taxation, but there's no doubt taxes will be higher at the next election than they were at the, at the previous one. And living standards down. But, you know, I am optimistic because if you look at, say, business investment, which is a subject today, or the growth of the economy, they were much stronger under the last Labour government. I think if you put a strong economy, good public services, social justice together, that is the right formula. And I do believe, certainly for business and economic growth and business investment, we have a far better set of policies in the Labour Party than anything that we saw today. If you look at some of these spending projections going ahead for a few years, you know, post the next election, <laughs> You might think that this is effectively like a scorched earth policy for Labour. You're not going to have much money to spend. Public services already have what many people, including Paul Johnson of the IFS, told me today was a completely unrealistic set of projections. Mm. You'll end up having to spend much more on them than is co currently uh, ticketed for it. So you're going to have to make some difficult decisions, aren't you, right? Well, look, what are the difficult decisions you First of all, make? let's not be complacent about the next election. No one on the Labour side is. It's still mm -hmm. a very competitive election and we've got to do what needs to be done and very few parties do get the chance to come from a, a defeat like we had in 2019 to win an election, so we're, we're humble if about you, that and doing if it. If you do... But look, you're right, this, would be, a, this would be a terrible inheritance. But I would say if you look at Labour's policies, they do relate to each other. So, that, for instance, that policy to put more money into the NHS by scrapping the non-DOM regime for the super-rich... How that much brings, is the non-DOM? How much is that going to be? It would bring in £2.3 billion. £2.3 okay. billion. So I mean, I know that sounds a lot. But just let me... Billion. On the point, you see, that brings down some of the £20 people... £20 billion who are, pounds have been taken out I, today. I, I know, but that That's takes... That's have a lot of non-DOM That, that takes out... That uh, puts people back into the economy, into the labour market, who are currently signed off long-term sick. That's one of the big barriers. It's one of the big problems we've got on the economy. That then relates to more workers. That helps with economic growth. These policies link together. If you look at the support for mental health that we put forward, which would come from the changes to taxation for private education, again, mental health, a major reason why people are being signed off work in such large numbers. We haven't got a, a participation rate in the economy that's even gone back to the pre-pandemic level. We're a real outlier there. If you look at our plans for you know, the jobs of the future, the green prosperity, plan, industrial strategy, that's about the economy growing faster. I am not saying it would be easy, and if you look at, the frankly, the mess of the last 13 years, I, I know it would daunt some people, but we are really confident in what we are developing and putting together, and we do believe it would be far superior to anything we've seen so far from the government. Um, would you keep the cut to national insurance? Do you think that's a good move? Well, we did oppose the rise to national insurance, if you remember, that back to who was the Prime Minister? Boris Johnson, I think, at, at that point. It's quite, it's quite hard to keep track. Yes, because we believe taxes on working people are too high, and that's because growth has been too low. But let's be clear about this. If you look at the rise in taxation under this government and this parliament, it's equivalent to about 10 pence extra onto national insurance. It's gone up 10 pence, it's coming down 2 pence, it's still a big rise. People are not going to be looking at this thinking, you know, great times, good times here. And we all welcome inflation coming down. That's, I would say, global factors, not the government's uh, own activity and actions. But, you know, the cost of living crisis, food inflation in particular, is still really hard for people. I just, it was almost like watching someone who was Chancellor for a different country make some of that statement today. And I think people will be frustrated by that. You're pretty clear that you think the tax burden's too high, taxes on working people are too high. But I guess my question is, do you need to level with people that if you really believe that, if Labour's not going to put up taxes, as the Conservatives claim, then public services are going to be squeezed, really squeezed, if you win the next election. Well, I would actually say it's slightly different to that, because I would say if economic growth is not higher than it has been for the last 13 years, maybe it's because it's been below the, the historic trend rate of growth in the UK economy. Look, I'm so, maybe I'm, maybe it's because I'm not on a call. I'm, I'm just yeah. getting a bit bamboozled mm -hmm. here. You know, my question is, do you not need to level with people that if you're not going to put up taxes, then public sending would be squeezed no, if no, you win the, the election? No, because the other variable is how fast the economy grows. And if it grows as it has done for the last 13 years, any decision will be hard. Public spending, taxation, it will all get worse. I mean, you've got to... People need to understand just how poorly, by historic levels, things have been under this Conservative the growth government. Protection, the growth pro projections, including after the next election, is basically flatlining. The, on the, on, so on you're the, not going to have, yeah, like... On the trajectory of this growth that you can get the proceeds of. You're but not the, Gordon the, Brown. The idea we could grow, we couldn't grow higher than 2%, which is what we would broadly expect the British economy to do, Let's not get into this fatalistic trap that we have to only perform as badly as we have done under the Conservative Party. Of course there's a better future ahead, but if growth is low, taxes go up, and you don't get good public services for that, you get poor public services. If the economy is growing more strongly, and that requires 
proper industrial strategy, government investment, our green prosperity plan, getting Britain building, I mean, planning reform, really tame stuff from the Chancellor today. We're going to be far bolder than that. Reform of the apprenticeship levy, making Brexit work better, okay. more power for mayors. These are the things that would really move the dial. But whatever, if, if, that, if that doesn't happen, it's always going to be about spending cuts and higher taxes, and I don't think we should put up with that. That's great. That's what everyone wants. It's that elusive... Elusive magic thing that everyone wants it's to It's not magic, it's good policy, and we haven't had good policy for a long time. OK, thank you very much indeed. Jonathan Reynolds there, uh, uh, Shadow uh, Business Secretary. Right, I just want to update you on the vehicle explosion in Niagara Falls at the Rainbow Bridge, because we are getting reports that a vehicle crashed into a checkpoint structure at a high speed. There currently two casualties, were told, involving the occupants of the vehicle. Now, authorities are trying to determine whether or not the incident was intentional, and if so, what was the motive? Well, a senior White House official has said the White House is closely monitoring the situation. Law enforcement is on scene and investigating. Uh, Canada apparently reinforcing all border security measures. That's according to a public safety minister. And they also said that they're taking the situation extremely seriously. Uh, right, we'll give more updates on that story as they come in, but I'm just going to wander over to uh, the panel and bring in uh, John and Tim uh, again. I mean, everyone wants growth, don't they? It's, <laughs> it's hard, though, isn't it? I mean, maybe Labour are right. Would you say would you say he's got a point that, you know, the policies of, La of a Labour I, government would make it easier? With my colleague Andrew Fisher, before Labour Party conference, we did a what I used to do every year anyway, Shadow Chancellor, and went through each department and costed how much would it take us to get back to 2010 levels? It's 78 billion. 78 billion, that's how much has been cut overall. On growth, to get a one percentage growth um, increase, you need to invest anyway, it takes time. That would bring in 15 billion according, 14 to 15 billion according to the IFS. So initially, you're not going to be able to rely upon growth to tide you over in terms of in reinvesting in our public services. So it will come down to taxation. And I think the Labour Party, as we move towards the general election, the Labour Party will have to start spelling out then the, the scale of expenditure that's needed they, and where it will come from. Labour said they're not going to put up personal taxes, right? I'll just give a, a small couple of small examples, because it doesn't have to be income tax going up and certainly not for ordinary workers anyway, but capital gains tax, equalising that with income. The TUC and, other independent, and a number of independent think tanks have said that will bring in anything between 14 and 17 billion. That could cover the social care costs, for example. So there are elements, if you make the taxation system fairer, then you could then start affording the development of public services that we need. But we can't go on the way we are. But this NHS problem, 7.9 million now on our waiting lists, and that's a lot of the sick and uh, people who we're now trying to get back into work can't get the treatment that they need. What do you think? We've got, you know, tax, we've got spending cuts, we've got growth. What, what's your sort of solution, do you think, Tim? I don't know what my solution is, but one thing, this, this guy who's a lot to the left of me, <laughs> at, least, at least he tells people where, you know, how it is. You know, and I think people are getting fed up with, um, you know, the evasion. You, you get a Labour spokesperson on you know, any bulletin and they say about the NHS has been cut too much, the courts have been cut too much, defence has been cut too much. And then you say, well, what are you going to do to put that right? And they talk about this non-DOM tax, which you quite rightly point out is only going to raise £2 billion. There isn't, on, from either party, a really honest saying, we're going to have to cut public spending, this is how we're going to have to live within our means, or we're going to put up taxing, taxation in a, in a significant way. And I think the voters smell something fishy, but at the moment, I don't know whether it's our fault as voters, whether it's the media's fault, whether it's the politicians' fault, that candour about the state we're in is missing. And I think, actually, the first party that really tells the truth, almost like a doctor saying, you're ill, it's going to be a tough period of treatment, but, you, could, you know, there's lots of evidence it works and you'll be OK in five years' time. The party that kind of levels with people in that way might be surprised at the reaction. Perhaps I'm naive, but I think there may be a market for that. What do you make of that? I think at this stage, yes, because people have had enough of 30 years of austerity. They know what a mess we're in, and they know it's going to require something radical to tackle those policies, that, those problems that we face. 
And I think as long as you're introducing fair taxation policies, people will go with it. But in addition to that, people need to know how it will affect them personally in their local community. So, for example, we discussed housing earlier, investment in housing. We could say just how that would affect that local community, how it would affect local families, and people will support it. I'm, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you both very much uh, indeed. I did tell you at the beginning of the programme that we were expecting that press conference by the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Um, we are expecting that very shortly, so we thought we'd cross to the United States, where we can talk to our US correspondent, James Matthews, who's standing by uh, for us. What are we expecting to hear? I was hoping Hi, to speak to Sophie. you. There we go. Um, Great. Sophie, I, uh, there is news coming from Niagara Falls, which um, we have been monitoring, haven't we, over the course of the past hour. A vehicle has exploded. The FBI and local state police are on the scene assessing exactly what has happened and what the motivation was behind what happened. A vehicle, according to witnesses, drove at speeds of over 100 miles an hour into the Customs and Border Patrol area on the U.S. side of the famous Rainbow Bridge. That's the bridge that extends across the falls from Canada into the U.S., this incident happened on the U.S. side. The vehicle, according to witnesses, uh, overtook a stationary vehicle in front of it, hit the structure, and there was a fire and then an explosion which sent the vehicle into the air some 30, 40 feet. So there was a loud bang. Witnesses report an explosion. Uh, we are told there were two casualties inside. Senior law enforcement sources are telling our partner network in the United States, NBC, that at this stage there has been no discovery of any explosive device, although I would say there is contradictory, contradictory reporting amongst media outlets on this side of the Atlantic. So that's where we are at this stage. Pictures from the scene show uh, a singed booth uh, at the Customs Border Patrol point. That is a booth where uh, drivers will have passports checked and there will be immigration controls and so on. And early reports suggest that beyond the two casualties associated with the vehicle, there is one other casualty okay, James. Uh, from the building that has been taken off. James, I'm going to have to leave you there because we're going to take you to Tel Aviv where Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu holding a news conference. Before I begin, I would like to address the families of the hostages, our brothers and sisters. Last night, I convened the, gov the government in order to approve the first stage in the deal for the return of the hostages. Since the beginning of the war, I have not stopped thinking about them, and I do not stop thinking about you, the families. I've met with you. I heard from you. Everything you're going through, I heard from you about this ongoing nightmare, the torment of uncertainty and the concern that knows no boundaries. And when I meet with you, you always attach the families of the pictures of your loved ones to your chest, to your heart. And my colleagues and I, we look at each and every picture, these pictures are a call for action. Since the outbreak of the war, we are indeed taking action constantly in order to bring them back home, to bring them all back home. And when I say all, I mean all of them. And that includes Ron and Adar and Abera and Hisham. We've defined the goals of this war very clearly to obliterate Hamas, to release our hostages, and to guarantee that the day after Hamas, Gaza will no longer pose a threat on Israel. 
we said that we will do everything we can in order to create the condi conditions for releasing the hostages. And this is what has happened. What paved the way for this deal is a combination of two great efforts. The first effort is massive military pressure, incessant pressure that we exert on Hamas. And I would like to praise the IDF and the ISA for their tremendous activities in order to create this pressure. The second effort is the great diplomatic effort and pressure that we're exerting for the release of the hostages. We were engaged in a very tough negotiations. We were very firm about it. And I just re spoke with President Biden a few minutes ago, and I thanked him for everything he did in order to improve the outline of the deal. And indeed, such an improvement was achieved. The combination of the military effort and the diplomatic effort, this is what made the conditions ready for the release of the hostages. And I believe that this combination will enable the return of more hostages in the next stages. The current outline will not include the release of murderers and it does include the agreement of representatives of the Red Cross for their visits to the hostages and bringing medicines to that to them. And I've heard that the Red Cross says that uh, they haven't heard about it, but this is the explicit item in the deal. The Red Cross will be allowed to visit the hostages and give them any medicine that they need. And I do expect of the Red Cross to do their job. Citizens of Israel, as the Prime Minister of Israel, I often find myself in a position in which I need to make very difficult decisions between a hard choice and an even harder one. And that is the case with the release of the hostages. The effort to bring them all back home continues constantly. And at this point in time, we can achieve the release of babies and children, mothers and women with a sword literally at their neck. This is the edict of releasing hostages and we have a great moral imperative to bring to their release. In the history of the state of Israel, whenever it was possible, we released hostages through military campaign and we did that even though we paid a heavy price. It happened at Sabena, the Savoy Hotel and at Antebe and it even happened in this war just a few weeks ago when we released in a very bold military operation the soldier but that's not always possible. And this is why we are not waiting. We are seizing each and every opportunity to release our hostages because to bring them back home is a sacred mission. The IDF and the entire security establishment support this deal. And they've clarified time and again yesterday in the government meeting that uh, the safety of our forces will be guaranteed during the pause, the ceasefire. And during this time, the IDF will prepare for the continuation of the war. In the wee hours of the morning, the government reached its decision. And I wholeheartedly believe, along with my uh, fellow ministers, that this is the right decision. I'd like to thank all my uh, peers for uh, joining me on this decision. Minister of Defense Gallant, Minister Gantz, the Chief of General Staff Herzi Alevi, the Director of the Mossad, Dadi Barnea, the Director of the ISA, Ronen Bar, Major General in Reserves, Nitzan Alof, and Brigadier General in Reserves, Gal Hirsch. All the people who have helped and who have acted in order to bring about this release, as well as all the ministers. Citizens of Israel, I wish to be clear, the war continues. The war continues. And we are going to continue with this war until we achieve all of our goals to bring back all of our hostages, to obliterate Hamas, and to ensure that the day after Hamas, there won't be any agent, any organization that rules Hamas, which advocates terrorism, participates in terrorism, and educates for terrorism. We are going to bring back safety and security both to the north of Israel and to the south of Israel. We we are winning and we are going to continue to fight until we reach absolute victory. And we are doing so thanks to the courage of our brave troops and thanks to the sacrifice of our sons and daughters, the great heroes of this country. And I always remember this victory, this triumph comes with a heavy price. Our soldiers that are risking their lives
lives for all of us, our hero soldiers who were killed in order to protect our home. This evening, I spoke with Avichai and Tali Barazani. Their son, Dvir, from the paratroopers brigade, was killed in action this week in Gaza, in the battle zone in Gaza. I've known Avichai for many years. He comes from the security establishment, and he told me that he wrote to his son, Dvir, as you go to fight Hamas, remember that there are 400 Israeli citizens who were murdered brutally by a terrible enemy. They are all standing behind you. Avichai and Tali had asked me, and all the bereft parents that I spoke with asked for the same thing. Please carry this through until you reach absolute victory. Citizens of Israel, I stand here this evening in order to say something very clear to you. This is exactly what we're going to do. We are going to fight together and God willing, together we will win.